Hey guys, it's Goosebumps Completionist, and today I'm bringing you another book review from the classic original 62 book series from the original Goosebumps run. And it's book number 59, The Haunted School. Now, The Haunted School and I go way back to my early childhood when I first got into Goosebumps. This was actually, I believe, within like the first 20 or so Goosebumps books I ever read when I was younger. I can remember seeing the cover of this in my library. If you don't know the story about my library experience when I was a kid, that was basically how I got all my Goosebumps books. I hardly owned any of them. I only had a handful of them that I was actually able to find at yard sales or maybe I was lucky enough to get from Borders Books back in the day. Uh, but The Haunted School was at my local library and my library copies when I was younger did not have synopsises on the back. So I looked at this cover and I was like, this looks creepy. <laughs> I'm going to pick this up and read it. And I remember this book kind of scaring me when I was a kid. And I read it maybe once or twice, but it genuinely creeped me out to the point where I, I didn't really like to read this one because <laughs> this was one of the few that got to me a bit. Um, and over the years, I've kind of reconnected with it at various points. And I've been saving this one since I've started this channel for a rainy day. And I think it's finally come... For me to finally cover this book because I've been jonesing to read it and kind of refresh myself on it. And I have to say, this is probably up there as some of the best Goosebumps books of all time. <laughs> Maybe not quite all the way that you would think uh, for me by making that statement, but this is definitely in the upper echelon of Goosebumps all day long in the play. It baffles me how this book for being as reprinted as it is, is not really that talked about in the mainstream fandom. It seems like maybe because this is like a very late in the game original 62 book that some people probably forgot this one exists, or maybe because it's only seen a book 10 reprint in 2003 reprint and it hasn't been reprinted in classic Goosebumps or brought up in anything in recent Goosebumps media, that people are like, all right, well, at least we had this as a cult favorite kind of thing. Sometimes that's what it is with these Goosebumps books, especially these later ones. But I have to say, if you have never read Goosebumps before, and maybe you've seen Twilight Zone, maybe you've seen Tales from the Crypt, maybe you're familiar with horror, but you've never tried Goosebumps because you're afraid of the stigma that the series has for being just goofy stories and nothing of substance or not that scary, you need to read Haunted School. <laughs> You need to try this book out and see what this book is cooking with. Because if you see the potential that this book has, it might change your perception and your stigma about Goosebumps and kids horror in general, for that matter. Yeah, this is a must-read recommendation for me. You need to check this book out. I love this. <laughs> so take that for what you will. So with that out the way, let's get into the plot overview of The Haunted School without giving too much way, uh, away, of course. So the story starts off with this... 12 year old kid named Tommy Frazier and he is of a I guess a blended family now because his father and his mom is divorced or maybe she died or something I forget the exact details on that even though I just reread this book <laughs> but uh he has a new stepmom right and Tommy may be on the uh pudgier side as he describes himself he's very open in his monologue about how insecure he is in some facets of himself and off the bat you get a sense of how kind of relatable Tommy is just your average kid right he has these every person flaws that a lot of people probably can identify with and he's also a new kid at this new school because his father and his stepmother have packed him up and moved him to a new town and now he's in this new middle school fresh you know, like a fish out of water, fresh into a new environment. Uh, I think he's in sixth grade. So that's kind of high age for a sixth grader, but, you know, we'll just roll with it. Um, and he needs to make new friends. So early in the book, we see him in the first chapter interacting with this boy named Ben and this girl named Talia, who are on this decor decoration committee for this dance that's coming up in school. And Tommy goes into his backstory with the with the reader in his monologue about why he joined this club, and it's that he wants an opportunity to meet friends and have you know an easy way to kind of buy into a friend group without being you know the new kid and get that stigma attached to him, and then make it harder for him to kind of fit in socially. So he's kind of done this for preservation. 
<laughs> or I guess an investment for his social future, which I thought was a neat angle for a Goosebumps character. Uh, I haven't seen something like that since like Craig Morgenstern from Are You Terrified yet, so that was awesome. Um, but yeah, Tommy's great off the bat, and we get right into the nitty gritty of that. And um, his peers, Talia and Ben, have kind of recruited him to do some annoying things. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were used to doing, I guess, before he got involved with the club, or maybe they all got involved at the same time and they just haven't, you know, offered Tommy to do it yet. Uh, but uh, they want him to essentially <laughs> go venture off into the, uh, to the art room, which is, I guess, a few stories above the gymnasium where they do uh, their work in, essentially, to go fetch him some supplies. And Tommy ends up getting lost, <laughs> trying to find this uh, art room of sorts. And uh, he ends up finding the art room uh, where he needs to go. Uh, and he gets the paint cans that he needs to gather. But trying to find his way back, he gets lost in this older part of the school. And this is, you have to keep in mind, when they're doing this, uh, you know, decoration committee stuff. It's after school hours. The only person around us is janitor that has a cigar in his mouth and maybe the principal that might be lingering around in the hallways, but there's literally nobody in sight in the school building. And where Tommy's at when he's coming back from the art room is in this isolated part of the, the, the whole uh, school, let's just say. And it's in, in, in what they call like the old section or the old wing of the school. So he ends up getting lost, and he tries to find his way back to the gym, and he ends up stumbling across this uh, relatively closed-off area where he's hearing these voices kind of calling out to him, saying, help me, and he's freaked out, and he's like, all right, well, he's trying to follow the trail of voices, trying to find his way back to the gym, and he ends up stumbling across this room. <laughs> and this room has these life-sized, like, puppet mannequin things that resemble children, and he goes inside and like touches their skin and it kind of feels real, you know, a little too real for him. And he's like, what the world did I just stumble across? It looks some like some type of memorial or something. And then he hears a voice and it's the principal. And the principal, Miss Borden, I think here's her name, tells Tommy that he shouldn't be in this room. This part of the school is closed off. And uh, Tommy's like, okay, well, then what, do, what, what did I just stumble across? And she's like, well, this has to deal with a tragedy that happened with kids who lost their lives. They were part of the first class from 1947, and uh, 25 kids went missing, and they were never found, so they're presumed dead, essentially, and this is why this exists. And Tommy's like, okay, well, that's weird. And she's like, yeah, now that you know it's here, just don't ever come back here again, because this part is closed off <laughs> from, I guess, the public. So Tommy gets escorted by the principal back down to the gym, uh, and his peers are like, oh, wow, what took you so long? And uh, <laughs> essentially, um, uh, his friend Ben has to leave early, but Talia decides to stay behind. And Talia, uh, you know, she has this weird relationship with uh, Tommy. And I, I haven't touched on this scene that happened before, but uh, Tommy was so enthusiastic, and I don't know if this happens after this first interaction with Talia or after, I think it's after, uh, may or maybe before, where he has this interaction with, like, this goth girl named Greta, and she's, like, a foot taller than him, has obviously hit puberty before he has, and uh, he accidentally knocked her over, and she essentially almost started a fist fight with him, <laughs> so Talia is, like, giving him some advice about that, and she's just... Uh, looking cute, I guess, to Tommy, and he's kind of admiring her, and then as they're both bonding, making these banners and stuff, uh, they kind of realize, you know, that the time is kind of running late and they need to get home. Well, the, the following day, or within the next few days, they're back at school, and Tommy's in a classroom with um, his friend Tali again, and she's putting on her makeup, and of course, Greta comes into the classroom and starts to pick on Talia and takes her lipstick and uh, tries to pass it around to this other dude. And Tommy is just kind of observing it and watching Talia essentially get bullied by this girl. And Tommy tries to stand up and be the hero and put a stop to it. Uh, and the only reason why this event broke out was because their teacher left to go, I guess, work on paperwork in, in the front office or something. Uh, but 
Tommy trying to do the right thing obviously sees that his friend Tali is very obsessive with this lipstick of hers, uh, which is this bright red lipstick that she's constantly wearing. And uh, once he manages to get it out of Greta's hands, she like dies for it and gets it back in her clutches. And she's really shaken up by the ordeal. And uh, it's made more evident uh, once Tommy basically gets in trouble for what happened that uh, he was willing to do this for his friend who's probably insecure about herself. And he's wondering why does she need to wear so much makeup and lipstick all the time when she's as beautiful as she is, right? Well, keep that in mind because right after this event, the kids are basically thrusted into the day of the dance. And they have been working on these... Uh, banners kind of off page prior to the events of the first chapter uh, which you know you see a goofy accident involving Tommy there but you know I'll leave that for a surprise for you but anyway <clears throat> they finish up the banners on the 11th hour and they start hanging them up getting getting the gym prepared for all the kids are about to pour in they have to set up this band area which is ironically made of like six band members and five guitarists comprise majority of them and then the drummer is none other than Greta herself and when the band comes in while a few kids are pouring in they accidentally uh break one of the banners that Tommy and um Tali and Ben worked hard on so Ben is like dude let's not let Greta and her band ruin the dance for us how about we go back to the art room upstairs and we go find some tape to tape it up we're not going to let them ruin this and Tali kind of hangs out and waits for them as they go off to the art room to get the tape. And I guess because Tommy wants to be showboated to Ben and like he's like, oh, I've, I've navigated this part of the school by myself. When they're heading up to the art room, Tommy's like, well, this area actually takes you up there quicker. And he's telling Ben to go this way when it's taking him this really weird direction where there's boards everywhere and it looks closed off and... They end up breaking through one of the boards and finding this elevator that looks like it takes them up to the third floor. And Tommy's like, haha, see, look, I told you I found a shortcut. And Ben's like, all right, cool, let's get in the elevator and go up to the art room to get the tape. And when they get in the elevator, they realize that the elevator is not working. It's, it's, it's not going up or down. They feel like they're stuck in it. The doors can't open after, they, after it's shut. But there, there's only two buttons that seem to have responses to them. Uh, and that is the emergency button, which makes a weird beeping noise when you push it. And there's this left and right button that they try pushing a couple times. And after pushing it a few times, the elevator starts to move, but it, it starts to move sideways. <laughs> and the boys are kind of thrusted into both sides of the elevator as the elevator is trudging along to the side. And then it eventually stops and opens up. And they're, they look out into pitch black. They exit the elevator thinking that they can get right back in. But the elevator doors shut almost immediately and pretty much leaves them in the total pitch black darkness. And mind you, I haven't, keep, I haven't brought this up. Tommy, uh, like I brought up earlier, he has been hearing voices saying, help me. Well, he starts hearing the voices again and he's... You know, he thought he heard the voices in his classroom the day before. I skimmed over that part because this does play a role now in the story. Where Tommy's like, okay, we're in the dark. Let's huddle against the wall. And, and let's just keep to the wall as we move along and traverse this room. Maybe we can find a light switch and find out where we're at in the school. This could be a closed off part of the building. And the two boys think that's what it is. But then they start hearing snickering and sneezing and coughing. And then people kind of humming some stuff and this freaks out the boys because it's pitch black of course and uh then all, all of a sudden the light switch turns on and there's five kids chilling in the room but the thing is when the light's on everything is in black and white and gray there's no color anywhere and the only color in the room is on the two boys and they realize that they have stumbled across this weird area where everything's black, white, and gray, right? And these kids are just mesmerized by the colors on, you know, Tommy and Ben's clothes and on their skin. And they're like, color, we haven't seen color in years, blah, 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 blah. And Tommy and Ben, of course, are weirded out and start asking questions like, okay, what's going on here? Why are you guys weird and creepy? And the kids essentially introduce themselves and they have a leader named Seth. And... The, the kids are like, well, you're you're now here in our world. Welcome. You're going to be here with us for a long time, possibly forever. 
And uh, the kids are like, what are you, what are you talking about? And Tommy and Ben essentially learn the truth via Seth and the other kids that they are re definitely related to the class of 25 people who went missing back in 1947. And they're in this world, what they call the gray world. And in the gray world, they can't age. They stay the same age. There's no color anywhere. And they've been here forever. <laughs> or at least to them, it feels like forever. And the only safe place in this world is inside the school. If you try to venture outside the school, that's where a bunch of crazies are at. And the boys don't quite know to put two and two together that the rest of the class has possibly gone crazy or are outside of the school. But they're like, all right, it seems like to me you guys are the crazy ones because you're telling us that we're stuck here. There's no options. You're treating us like we're like the only color beings here. This can't be real, right? And Ben especially is the big skeptic on it. But once Tommy realizes that his hands and Ben's hands are starting to turn gray themselves, they essentially realize they ha they're working with a time clock. They need to get back into the elevator and out of the school before the time runs out. Because if they turn gray, they're stuck like this forever. And um, essentially this is where the book starts to hit on in high gear. After learning this bombshell, they also get dropped a backstory from Seth and the kids about this uh, event on how they ended up in this world from the beginning. And they were transported here after a school photographer named Mr. Chameleon back in 1947, who was thought to be an evil man in this town uh, of sorts where they live to begin with was upset with the students for being rowdy during their very first picture session ever. Uh, and since back in the day, uh, photos were taken in black and white and, you know, gray, of course. Uh, after the photo was taken from Mr. Chameleon, a bright white light flashed, and before they knew it, they were transported into this world without knowing what happened, really. And that's how they all disappeared essentially and that's recontextualized into that and that's not really a spoiler because that's like halfway through the book so anyways after that point the kids are like okay yeah mr chameleon sent you here okay cool you're great people okay cool we need to find a way out of here you guys are crazy you want us to keep stay in this <laughs> school classroom there's possible answers out there and the kids are like trust me we've tried everything we've explored this whole area we know that there's nothing out there, and if you go out there, it's way more dangerous. And the kids are like, all right, we'll take our chances. And they find this window, and they start escaping, and they notice that the moonlight and the stars don't even have color either, and they hear some voices off in the distance pretty much encouraging them to leave, and they do so, and they leave behind Seth and the other four kids, and they start running <laughs> in this weird gray world of sorts, and they look back to the school, and they see that it's Pretty much a whole different school than what they're used to. This world, quite honestly, is its own world. There's houses nearby. There might be a, a cat or something, but there's like hardly any people. And it's very weird. And there's this thick, dense fog rolling through the woods that they have to be, uh, happen to be traveling through. And when they start following the fog and get kind of lost in there, they start to kind of lose their eyesight a little bit because they've been in the gray for so long that they can't really see the existing color still on them as they're being absorbed into this fog. And then they have the interaction with the remaining school kids who possibly are pretty much <laughs> behaving like Lord of the Flies where they have lost their sanity and they have become basically tribalistic and uh, they do these real weird rituals and they pretty much capture the two boys and are holding them hostage around in a circle and saying, uh, turn, turn, and repeatedly doing so, kind of freaking the boys out. And they're like, why are you chanting this? And then they keep saying, turn, turn to gray. And it becomes more evident that they want them uh, to be gray people like them. So when Tommy and uh, <laughs> Ben start putting up a fight, and they're like, why are you guys acting so crazy? Why don't you guys spill it out? And they're like, uh, you know, there is no hope. We're stuck here forever. You know, you know, you need to look like us, blah, blah, blah. And you take the boys over to this area, which I'm assuming is like a tar pit or something where there's like black goop and these kids, like they drank it every night. And I guess that's what's implied to be making them crazy. And they spit it all over each other and cover each other in this black goop. And they want the boys to essentially be thrown in there <laughs> like Harley Quinn <laughs> Uh, in uh, the Suicide Squad movie origin, where we see her getting thrown in from the Joker to turn her crazy too. That's essentially what 
<laughs> they're trying to do to Tommy and Ben here. But uh, but luckily for Tommy and Ben, Seth and the other kids possibly come back to rescue them and try to escort them back to the school, which may or may not succeed. And then at this point of the story, there's a huge bombshell uh, revelation about a possible kid that may or may not have escaped the gray world before. And this gives a glimpse of, glimpse of hope for Tommy and Ben. And this may or may not come to fruition in the final act where they see this said person possibly come back via the elevator. Uh, who knows? Or maybe a different way. I don't want to exactly spoil it. And as the, the time is clicking down to the final seconds before they can completely turn, they may or may not find a back doorway of sorts to get out of the situation. And there's a certain mechanism that if you can pick up on hints in literature, you'd be able to spot it early on in the book. But it involves that said thing. And uh, Tommy and Ben might be able to pull themselves out of harm's way. I'm not going to spoil it. And the ending kind of implies what's going to become after they get themselves out of it. And it may or may not involve a certain character that might be lurking in the shadows the whole book. <laughs> and that essentially is what you're going to expect out of the haunted school. So, yeah, I have a lot of positives with this book, so I just want to get them out the way first and foremost. This book has some of the best pacing in some of the best Prowse writing I have seen Arl Stein do, or Ghost Rider. I don't really know who wrote this book. This was a later OG62 book. I've said it in the past, I'm hard confident that there are some Ghost Riders here in the original 62. Some books really don't feel like Arl Stein. And in a lot of ways, this book has its Stein qualities to it, but it's also unorthodox in how it's paced, in how the story unfolds. It doesn't really feel like Stein would write this per se but to if he did write it or whoever did write it they did a fantastic job at making the story just feel electric and make you feel glued to what's happening in the story because this is one of those books that kind of trim the fat and trim the nuance yeah there's some slice of life moments early on that could possibly carry over to the back half of the book but even in the mundane aspects of like the first i would say 30 or so pages the character interactions are super fun. Tommy has a great monologue to him. He is a very likable and relatable character. Uh, and he he has this fish-out-of-water trope, but he also has this super cool, unique flair to him where he is kind of joining this club for social capital. He's joining this as like an insurance policy to help him gain friends without having to you know, do it the old school way and go a long time possibly without making friends or even worse, becoming stigmatized as the new kid and nobody would want to hang out with him. So he's doing this for social stock essentially and that's a really fun angle and I like that preservationist side of him. And he has these heroic qualities that stick out where he's willing to do daring things and he's willing to put himself in harm's way. Yes, he does have some you gotta believe me kind of in his veins a little bit, but he's not annoying about it he's not whining when people don't listen to him he's like all right don't listen to me i'll show you <laughs> or here i'll just tell you about it if you don't believe me i'll find a way to show you um he's he's a really great character i think ben who is the arguably the second main character of the story he has some great dynamics with tommy and they both have polar polarizing opinions about things early on uh, in the book and you see these polarizing opinions take effect in the gray world of sorts that they end up in and they have a they have a good grounded relationship where one character's strengths helps the other's weaknesses and vice versa. So Ben is another good character. I think Talia is also a really nice character. She has this weird angle where she's kind of obsessed with her looks. And uh, there may be something with involving her in the book that is also very touching. I don't want to get into the nitty gritty, but... There's some sense of, you know, reason why she has so much stock and makeup and uh, her appearance and stuff like that. And when you learn those reasons, it's it's pretty deep hitting stuff. <laughs> There's some great themes woven into it. And that's also another fantastic, fantastic compliment to this book. The symmetry, uh, or I guess the symmetry and the willingness to tie themes together in the way that this book does is very daring for Goosebumps. You have these ideas of um, a town kind of building a legacy off a of tragedy 
and what that can bring in terms of commentary. And then you have the main layer of what the book is talking about. And it's talking about fitting in to people that have shared experiences with you. And you can really tell, <laughs> well, that's what the uh, story is going for, especially once you get into the gray world stuff. And that, that leads me into the gray world itself. This has to be one of the coolest concepts I've seen in Goosebumps. Uh, not only is the world kind of creepy and very Twilight Zone-esque in that existential way, but there's some frightening stuff in here, especially when we're getting down to the Lord of the Flies angle they do with some of these kids that uh, are part of the class of 1947. That was pretty freaky stuff, and it, it was it was eerie in like a in like a just morbid way how they just behaved and how deranged they were and how they've lost so much of their sanity being stuck in this world. It's it's tragic, but it kind of shows you that being around the unhinged sometimes can be a, even more <laughs> menacing than being around somebody that's cold, calculated, and knowing what they're doing. Um, and that brings you, that brings some primal fears out in the story for me. It just really works. There's something about being in a creepy hallway and being in the pitch black as well that just gets under my skin a little bit and it actually gave me goosebumps reading some of some of the prowls in this book where the kids are kind of crawling through the dark and feeling like something's touching them or they hear this creepy whisper that's that's eerie stuff and this is why i think this book is just top shelf i mean just the emotions that you get from this book as well and these kids kind of winding down this clock of doom essentially and they try they're trying to navigate this and figure it out and then you have this backstory of why all this is happening. The, the emotions of this book is just so rich. And all the way through the climax, it's an exhilarating read. And then we get to the ending. Now we're getting to some negatives. And this is my only negative with the book, right? There's a character mentioned called Mr. Chameleon about halfway in with the, with the kids in the gray world. About how he was essentially the person that sent them to the, to the world and all that. He's a character that quite literally operates in the shadows. Well, the ending kind of implies that Mr. Chameleon may or may not still be around. But we have not seen him actually present in the book. And while I think that's a, a very smart way to kind of hide a villain in the story, I truly feel that this book's ending should not have ended where it ended. In fact, I would actually recommend, for this book being 120 pages, for once... This book probably should have deserved to be 160 pages just to have 40 pages of Mr. Chameleon stuff kind of flushed into the story because I guarantee you if that stuff was included this quite honestly could have been the best Goosebumps of book of all time. But there's just not enough Mr. Chameleon there and there's not enough meat to chew on with this gray world and his association with it for me. There's just n there's none of that here and I wish it was sadly and when I have to wish something to exist that doesn't exist in a book. Sometimes that can be a negative, sometimes it isn't. But for me, in this specific case, there's nowhere near enough to kind of make up for that for me. And uh, that's just where I'm coming from. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Um, but that does not shortchange the fact that I think this book is absolutely fantastic. From a zero to five star basis, automatically this is getting higher than a 4.5, which is great or higher for me. And where I've settled with this, because of that one negative, I'm willing to give this book maybe like a 4.8 out of 5 stars. Yes, this is one of the best Goosebumps books of all time, with one minor flaw, flaw kind of hanging around in there. I just wish there was more Mr. Chameleon, but other than that, this book was fantastic. This is a must read. And I can totally see why Ghost of Fear Street made a book called Attack of the Vampire Worms, kind of following this formula. And I know this might be a hot take. I think I like Vampire Worms more than this book. But I still really love a lot about this book and highly recommend it to you all that you go check this out. So yeah, that's my thoughts on The Haunted School. Let me know down in the comment section if you've read this book before. Do you love this? Do you hate this? I'm dying to know. And I'll see you next time.